Hi, and welcome to Chasing Squirrels Podcast. I'd like to start off the podcast with a couple pieces of advice. So, when I first started my podcast, I had a really rigid list of questions that I wanted to ask, a whole lot of stuff that I thought I should do if I was going to start a podcast. And I quickly found out, pretty much part way through the first episode, that that type of rigidity didn't really get the conversation flowing. So, what I realized when I opened up the conversation is that I was able to see more of the story of education, more a story of the teacher experience, and more a story of the student successes that were happening around me. But I didn't quite stop there because I also started to think about well, what was going on outside of my teacher bubble. So, the first piece of advice that if you are considering doing a podcast, in this case, I have an education podcast. But consider the boundaries of what you can see. Think of the boundaries of your actual stomping ground within your area of specialty, if that happens to be what you're focusing your podcast on, and take one step through that line. So, in this case, if you're starting an educational podcast, think about including principals, think about including consultants, think about including parents, even the students. That's the first piece. Second piece, See if you can get so far out of your jurisdiction that you can see your own experience from the outside in. In my case, I've reached out and I've spoken to some people in Australia. I've spoken to some people in the States. I've stock,、uh, spoken with quite a few people that are just outside of my board as well. And in that case, I really am getting to see some of the similarities of the challenges that other educators have. But every once in a while, something pops because it's just far enough that it doesn't have any connection to, to my own board. And some of that stuff you can steal and bring back to your own practice. The conversation tonight is of that type of a frame. It's a remarkable conversation where I got a chance to speak with Michelle Cassidy. Uh, Michelle Cassidy, she's a, a clinician who works for a school board and heads up their, their mental health strategy. And this type of conversation is a little bit of a first for me because it so specifically, so specifically draws me out of my classroom to consider the larger picture of what's going on in my board. We get into some amazing topics, including mental wellness for students up to age six. We also talk about mindfulness and the challenge of including that in daily practice in the classroom. And we get a little bit of a peek of what she's working on next, but I'll leave that to the podcast for you to find out. Once again, thanks for finding the podcast, and I do think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Good afternoon, Michelle. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So, if you could, could you throw down you know, your introduction? Could you introduce yourself? Sure.、Um, well, obviously, my name is Michelle. I work in a large school board as a clinician responsible for leading the mental health strategy for the board. So, one of the things that、um, I don't get to often in the podcast is sort of getting outside of the teacher bubble.、Mm-hmm. Um, right now, in my program where I teach, it's myself and a Uh, counselor,、mm-hmm. and we've, we've made it really important between us to use the educator moniker to sort of talk about what we do. We, we have our spaces,、mm-hmm. but working together, we sort of come at the, the space with that educator.、Mm-hmm. So I will say I'm, I'm thrilled to sort of be able to, I guess, officially get entirely out of that EDU space.、Um, to that end, I'm curious a little bit about. How did you come to become connected with education? For sure. So, for me, initially in my career, I started out、um, mental health in more of a forensic setting. So, working with individuals who were、um, institutionalized,、um, having committed a crime、um, that was connected to a mental health diagnosis. So, it was primarily a rehab setting. Um, trying to support people to become whole again, to reconcile with the dysfunction perhaps in their life, their mental health challenge created.、Um, 
and what I noticed in that space of work was that for many people, their mental health challenges began early in school, either directly attributable to school experiences that they had that perhaps injured or harmed them in some way, or perhaps mental illness that probably reared its head um, but went unattended in early childhood. And school came up as a recurrent theme often, and these were adults that I was working with. And for them to be able to crystallize, you know, when we would ask about a point in time when they first sort of became aware that there was an issue or a problem or um, before this became salient for them in their lives, it always was connected to school. So it made me wonder about how we get upstream of um, difficulties once people experience them. Um, in, in adulthood, you might be looking at years of pain, um, years of perhaps missed opportunities for intervention. And to be able to get upstream of that and be in a space where kids are and students are consistently and predictably, usually, um, allows for, I think, a huge opportunity to create change and perhaps alter the trajectory so that the adult story is one that's much more hopeful and helpful than the adults that I was trying to rehab at a very late stage. So uh, how long have you been out of that former portfolio and now um, in so I moved um, out of that forensic side into, I would say, a more proactive mental health approach um, in York Region, uh, moving from the Ottawa area to York Region. First worked at Pathways for Children, Youth and Families, what is now 360 Kids. Um, and in that space, I opened up Home Base. And when, we, when I was launching the concept of Home Base, it really was about working with schools to early identify students who may be at risk for homelessness and to try to interrupt that pathway somehow into one that was more helpful. And when you listen to the stories of people time and time again, what would be consistent would be, um, for many people, there's lots of, if we think about just homelessness per se, mm -hmm. there's lots of assumptions about why people arrive in that space. And what I found in my experience is that none of these kids were any different from any other student, but something didn't happen at some point in time, whether that was a restorative conversation, whether that was a mediation in a family conflict that escalated quickly and then a major change happened, um, or perhaps a lack of connection to school, lack of relationship with teachers, or an experience of adults in their life as generally wanting them to fail. And I just thought that was not what we want and hope. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from there kind of moved on into working into early years mental health for um, several years in the zero to six domain, really trying to get upstream, you know, from prenatal on, how do we support families to create the most um, protective family environments we can to support people to be mentally healthy. From there, obviously, that early years connection happened as... YRDSB and schools all across the province were beginning to really acknowledge that that JKSK time and that developmental space is a really, really key opportunity for us. And because of that work in zero to six mental health then started to bridge connections to working in the education space. And from then I was um, recruited into the board to work in a partnership capacity, building partnerships between schools and community agencies as a community resource facilitator. That was my first job at the board. So looking at assessing the needs of any particular school and then helping them create the partnerships that would support students and families to be successful. And then from that really was kind of shoulder tap to think about what would a more integrated model of mental health services look like? And so created Compass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Compass was um, really came from an idea um, on paper, and then my job was to make that live and breathe in York Region. And that's um, really then was my first foray into what I would call uh, school mental health service. And then now here I am. It's it, at the front end when I said being able to get outside the classroom bubble mm -hmm. and sort of look at look at system level 
just uh, the pieces that are all part, you know, the, the cogs that are sort of moving in a similar direction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of mind blown at the concept. On one hand, yes, one hand, no, of the concept of mental wellness focusing on zero to six. There's something about the zero mm -hmm. on the front end of that, that, and I get it, you say going upstream, but sort of to go that far mm -hmm. to see the seed point. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've seen you before in presentations, um, speaking to some of these things. Where, where's the most surprise when you speak to mental will, wellness? Because like I said, I'm, I'm sitting here on the zero to six and it's something I hadn't, I, I'm aware because, well, I'm aware because I have children and I'm aware because they're, they're in the elementary system. But putting that bracket age around it, I think some people may be surprised mm -hmm. for that to be a focus. Mm -hmm. So what is it like bringing that, that sort of like conversation forward? How do, how do people receive that, talking about mental, mental wellness at the zero to six? I mean, it could be at the next age, back it up. But for me, like I said, that's stunning. Well, I think for me, that's one of the only times I feel like people sometimes view the family holistically. So when you look at a baby that's not yet born, we're looking at... Um, we've got parents who have a vision for the child that they're mm -hmm. about to bring into the world, expectations, hopes, and dreams. But they are also autonomous individuals who have probably some needs to get met. That parenting, there's a piece of parenting that helps to achieve that for them. Mm -hmm. So there's this space in zero to six when it's almost acceptable for us to talk about mental health of a family. And then at some point that we become autonomous individuals and we talk about mental health of an individual separate uh -huh. from their family, which isn't necessarily helpful or healthy. And I find that as we move forward, it becomes a little bit about family blaming or parent blaming or, you know, there's a, a lot of the stigma gap when we think about mental health doesn't start. When we talk about a mental health conversation of zero to six, everybody buys in to wanting to set our kids up for mm. the best experience, to wanting to make sure that we are looking out for postpartum or baby blues and wanting to make sure that everybody loves that time. So we all, I think, societally have constructed this as a time of celebration when we embrace families and we wrap around them and we're, we have a year mat leave so that they can get the best start. And at some point, I feel like we then somehow do a disservice to families of no longer providing them with that same mm. level of attention to wellness for both themselves and their yeah. child. So I, I think what's interesting for me when I think about referrals for children's mental health, if you were to ask, we actually asked this question recently of several of our mental health providers in this region, the bulk of referrals exist in the primary division for them. So when we look at our IDT referral rates, the bulk of referrals have shifted to the primary division. Wow. So there's something that's either not happening or maybe happening in a different way than it has before mm -hmm. um, that makes us think about this time. When some of those referrals happen, is, the, is, it, is it the elementary schools bringing it forward? How, is the, how are the actual conversations brought forward primarily? Can a family approach, can, the, can, the, can a family approach the board directly or is it always through, let's say a proxy, like through the school noticing or sort of like the teacher noticing? Yeah, there's a couple of entry points. I would say when families approach an agency on their own for service, it often will be due to a family disruption or a okay. family transition or separation, divorce, for example loss of a, a, a parent, mm -hmm. death of a child, and so the resultant impact on families. When it comes through the school, what I would predominantly say or make the assumption is that up until school, families' only barometer of how a child should do, behave, look like, feel like, sound like, is their own child. Mm -hmm. And even if they have multiple children, a, a parent's lens on what's developmentally needing to happen is unique to their experience. Then when school happens, all of a sudden we have 20 kids in a room. And as a teacher or a DECE, I know how have the lens of multiple children. And it becomes easier for me to identify that for some children, maybe in a different space, maybe have um, some 
perhaps opportunities to learn some some skills that they may not have had the opportunity to learn up until this point in time. But I wouldn't necessarily know that as a parent. And then we put them sort of in this petri dish of a whole of other identical four-year-olds or five-year-olds or six-year-olds. And then all of a sudden we might start to notice that um, there's differences. And so trying to attend to those differences is about being able to intervene early. And usually I would say and I'm not an early years educator by any stretch, but just from a clinical lens, I would say usually it's just about a skills gap. Um, and so if we can do some structured intervention at that point in time and help to re, you know, build up some skills that children just may not have had the opportunity to learn up until that point, we can do a good job, I hope. You know, whether that's learning anxiety management strategies, learning how to be around sensory input that I've never had to be around before. Because as families, we tend to accommodate for our kids in ways. They don't like tags. We cut the tags out. They don't like the lights bright. We turn the lights down low. They don't like loud music. We can manage all of that. Once kids get to school, suddenly that management may not be happening. And that's where we can then begin to see. My connection to it, in some ways, I guess, could be through my program. But just as a general, um, a general observation, teaching at secondary, I've always felt there was a uh, sort of like a they're okay now. Mm, yeah. You know, and it's like that. It's mm -hmm. it's in it's the, it's the fish into the mm -hmm. pool. Go for it, right? And part of not really understanding the nature of the water or the other predators and the other the sort of the the landscape and the things that are sort of existent in there. And I always wondered about that. I wondered about you know, as myself, as a I mean, young children. Eventually, I will have teenage children. Mm -hmm. Observing my own thinking that way about what is it about that process where you start to believe that they're okay to sort of like take it on themselves. And I find with my program that generally speaking, the students that um, having, having been displaced from their home program, n not liking that at all, but typically the ones where the parents are still there, still involved, even one, even one guardian, one person that's coming to the meetings with them, you see forward movement and, and, and maybe change, but at least forward moment, mom, momentum, they're not stalled. Mm -hmm. So, in some ways, I, you know, it almost seems like that's the, I don't want to say it this way, but it almost seems the other untapped bookend. I mean, of course, when we talk about elementary and secondary, that's where we exist. Mm -hmm. But the, I think back to when I was at um, more, when I was in such a closed program, I always, I always wondered what, kind of what was just, what, what were the tools, what were the things that were sort of in motion there for the students that were arriving at those meetings without someone? Often the guidance counselor mm -hmm. would step up and kind of be the everything. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that was just my POV, as in I just wasn't seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I am curious, is there is there equal focus in sort of building those kind of robust tools at secondary? You know, the zero to six, you say that's where it's kind of it sounds almost like that's where it's at. Like you really want to, we want to do a good job there, mm -hmm. set the ball rolling. But then you have the middle school where mm -hmm. uh, you're test driving all those things. And then yeah. you sort of hit to high school. What's that look like now? What's the, and I guess I'm asking also because mm -hmm. I'm close program. I don't have, I don't see what the regular mm -hmm. schools have anymore. Mm -hmm. What's some of the work being done there? Um, so I, I would think a couple of things. I mean, one thing I would just want to say, just because you, you thought of, I'm thinking about this concept of parent attending the meeting, and I may be taking us on a tangent here. I'm up for it. But just from an equity perspective, what I do want to implant into that conversation is that as somebody who came, let's just say, from a social service system where I made $35,000 for most of my career, mm -hmm. to enter into an education space where flexible hours, great salary, vacations, all of that be, is the norm for the majority of the population of staff here. Not all, but the majority. It, I think that sometimes as schools, we expect things of parents that are not realistic. And so I would never want to make the assumption of a parent not being able to be present at a meeting means something other than that they're not present at mm -hmm. the meeting. And so it's about asking the questions of, is it accessible for them to be at the meeting? Are they perhaps brand new in a job or working shift work and they don't have any mm -hmm. blue time, no capacity, that if they don't arrive at work, they don't get paid. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes I think we create barriers for families in that regard. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that, to mm -hmm. say that. Um, but then when you look at what does it look like in high school, I think... <laughs> 
Here, I think what I find is that um, what I notice in high school is it feels like even both as parents or as educators, we struggle to strike the right balance. Mm in terms of how much do kids need us, how much do they not? How much are we over-parenting, how much are we under-parenting? How much as, as educators in a secondary system do we expect kids to hold their own and make good choices versus how much do we want to provide guidance to that? Um, and I think, I think when we just allow kids to pilot their own lives, I worry sometimes that we're asking them to step into shoes that are too big for them. So I think about, you know, even the loss of grade 13. If I look at that change in our system and look at the impact on kids and the elevations of anxiety that we see in secondary that didn't seem as present before, I feel like, you know, is it that we've taken five years and now we're making it happen in four, mm -hmm. uh, four and three? I don't know. I can't do math. That's why math is the focus here. I just worry that we're not allowing parents to always be parents. When they do try to parent, we say they're helicoptering. So there's judgment no matter how ever you enter this space of parenting or being an educator. And so looking at how do I navigate that I'm asking a 17-year-old to make decisions about the rest of their life, mm -hmm. what they want to be, you know, where they're going to go to university. Oh, oh, that's big stuff. Lord, I have tried and failed my hand at a million careers. I remember being in a small town high school, having really not a lot of parent engagement because of my parents' own unique mental health issues of their own, that I was pretty much piloting my own life from about mm -hmm. the age of 16. And I remember I made my university choices based on the McLean's Magazine rankings. Mm. Because that's what I thought. That was the dominant narrative. That's what I was told. You have to go here. And I actually remember saying no to a full scholarship at a lesser university because I thought I had to go to number one in the McLean's Magazine. And nowhere did any adult interrupt that thought. Mm. And so when I fast track to only just having paid off student loans two years ago, I think about how if there had been an adult at that point in time that could have supported and helped me shape that decision making differently, mm -hmm. it might have saved me 60 grand. Um, but it, it just, like, I, I feel like they're big decisions for us to be expecting kids to make on their own. Mm -hmm. But then on the on the flip side of that, I speak to students all the time whose parents are in the driver's seat about their career, their mm -hmm. education, which is equally damaging. And so it's about trying to find that balance in the middle of aptitudes, hopes, dreams, um, competency, capacity, where you want to see yourself, what are you passionate about. But to have to hear from a kid, I really want to be a mechanic, and my parent says I can't, mm -hmm. and that I have to be a doctor, that's heartbreaking. Um, because we all know what it's like to kind of exist in that space where we're not living our passions. It doesn't feel good for any of us. So I, I think that somewhere, if we could figure out how to meet in the middle, I think some of us have let go too much and some of us are still hanging on too much, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. You, you, there's a lot there. I loved, I loved that. I love the pushback as far as making sure that, that the gate isn't locked even before the conversation happens and setting up the meeting with the most, the meeting, the support, that moment, that moment where you have a table and you have paperwork that has to be signed and you're moving forward with it and hoping that you're going to have the, um, the individual about who it's talking about, the student, the kid, and also having somebody there at their side. Mm -hmm. um, and I totally get it. I get it. The, how the system in itself, because we have the concept of between the bells okay. and it's not made necessarily any easier by having different schools starting at different time. It still uh, is in opposition to someone that, you know, we think about when our access points are. It might be on lunch, mm -hmm. just before school, just after school. So we're talking about two different commutes. We're talking about a lunch time that's, you know, narrowed down to 37 minutes or whatever of access time. So I love that pushback because I think that is, that's critically important about the mobility of our system to be able to go to the spaces where it needs to be as opposed to expecting individuals to arrive at our table. Mm -hmm. I, I totally get that. And, and to the other part, one of the other things you had said about finding the balance of the direction. I've been in a couple conversations that 
come around the theme of productive struggle, mm -hmm. that idea that sort of by having hands off and letting, letting the child make decisions on their own, that, you know, we, I could, there's, there's that sort of naive phrase about, you know, building the plane on the way down kind of a thing. And that's really great when you're kind of going chest out, mm -hmm. almost, you know, bravado about being successful and being a risk taker. Mm -hmm. But I think to get into that space, there's a whole lot of learning. I'll never forget, you know, a, a meeting that I had with a parent who had high expectations of their child to use an agenda. Mm -hmm. And the child was just not getting it. There was no lesson that I could provide. There was no context that I could sort of make it of value. As we're sitting at the meeting, the parent pulled out an agenda and started to write down a bunch of things that they needed to write down. And I asked, I said, have you ever shared your agenda with your child to show directly how this moment that you're asking them to do, it's an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. it, it basically, what I'm looking at in this moment is like, your child needs to apprentice under you. Mm -hmm. They need to see how the tools that you're saying, your hopes and expectations are hung on something real. Mm -hmm. And you made me think about that, about having, having somebody there to help and having, it isn't, it, isn't, it isn't productive struggle where there's some fun factor to trying to figure out how to use a makey-makey or a Rubik's yeah. Cube or, yeah. oh, I just can't cut and paste right. It's more, it's a lot more powerful than that, but it's the same moment that we're hanging some kids over yeah. to figure it. Yeah, and I think there's some parallels for that for me when I think in the context of mental health because I often encourage parents to live the struggle out loud. Mm. Because I think one of our biggest stigma reduction tools that we have is, is A, first, is that modeling piece that you said. If I'm a parent, I'm about to go into a job interview, to be able to say aloud at the dinner table, as I have this job interview tomorrow, I'm really anxious right now. I'm worried I'm not going to sleep tonight because my mind is racing too much. i got to think about... I'm just talking this out loud. What are some strategies I can use to be able to prepare myself and to manage this anxiety? That is a beautiful lesson for a kid sitting at the table to realize it's okay to have anxiety. It can be situational and there's something I can do about it. Mm -hmm. But when we never talk about those things and we try to put on these faces of perfect people who have it all together, mm -hmm. we're not demonstrating coping. We're demonstrating hiding. And I think um, in all of the conversations I have with kids, like, they have this belief about their parent that their parents don't have problems. This is part of, I think, where the they don't get it comes from is because we don't allow them to see when we struggle and that we're human and that we're going to sort it through and that some of that problem solving, if that were to happen in real time out loud, I think that would go a long way at destigmatizing mental health challenges. Right? I think it's... Um, think we don't do a service to our kids. We teach them to brush their teeth. They see us brush their teeth, right? Mm -hmm. We teach them to eat right. They see us trying to manage how we eat right. Mm -hmm. um, they watch us all the time. And so, like, I, I've been working with my brother on this because he's recently gone through a divorce. And so trying to talk about, it's okay to have a bad night and to be crying and to say out loud, I'm just upset right now because our family's changing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm sad about that is a message to the kids that it's okay for them to be sad about that too and what can we do about this together. It just, I think it legitimizes those emotions and it makes them all okay. Whereas I feel we have done this piece, and it's kind of to what you were saying earlier in our pre-conversation is when you were approaching mindfulness in school, you were approaching it like a subject matter that you were trying to teach. Um, whereas when I look at opportunities to approach something as an experience and as a life skill, mm -hmm. um, that there's a lot more relevancy then to the learning for kids. Yeah. There's something, you make me think about that, that inverse relationship between em em emotion as communication to language as communication mm -hmm. and the flip where almost both get pinched off. <laughs> like it sort of, they, they sort of shift because I can remember thinking back on my children when they were younger and, you know, they, they cry. It's, it's that cry. And you go, oh, that cry means this. That could, you almost do the fine slicing of what each little cry could be. And then they get the words and then they shift from, they shift from that expressive emotional state into language. Mm -hmm. And then they learn how to imprint language 
around, sorry, emotion around a language. And I think somewhere in there, it gets lost in translation mm -hmm. because then we get swept up in it's not okay to say words that have emotional right. uh, fabric to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say, and, and almost uh, miscommunication, but it's not miscommunication necessarily uh, pushed by the person across the table. It's the person just not willing to say it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be embarrassed by being sad. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have anyone angry at me because I'm being confident. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating flip, and I'm not sure... I don't know how that happens. I don't know how we, how we get there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I mean, there's way too many factors to tease out. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is a, a pretty clear observation that from me that if I'm not comfortable with words and emotions and the expression in what I perceive to be a safe place, mm -hmm. then there's no way I can model it. Mm -hmm. I, I can't go there for my students. I can't go there for my own children. I can't go there for my significant other. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me think a lot about... You know, you had mentioned about, you know, me trying to teach mindfulness, and I'm, I'm not at peace with that. Mm -hmm. um, that's good, I think, for me. I'm going to figure out a better way to approach it. The activities just an as an experience will be maybe my more starting point, make it seem like this is just what everybody does. Mm -hmm. Everybody does mindfulness. You know, right. you just sort of an open invitation to participate in something that's already in motion. Right. I'll test drive that one. But it, it brings me to thinking about... Educators in general, mm -hmm. and educators in general, and their capacity to sort of wear the multi-hat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on one end, if I tag it to our conversation, that educator being the person that's there in the corner with the kid to help them with the thing, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But then I also expand it into, you know, the teacher in the system feeling as if their sort of wellness is also kind of... Yeah. They, it's, it's being checked, it's in check, and it's manageable. Mm -hmm. Um. What, okay, so let's start with this, this, the student, teacher, student kind of mindfulness stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a conversation last week with a teacher and they said, I'm just, I'm really afraid of, of taking a chance on developing mindful connections to the classroom. Mm -hmm. They struggled with because it's not in their curriculum. Mm -hmm. So that was also part of the conversation, mm -hmm. but they had it, they've noticed, they've noticed that it would be great. Right. So I kind of gave kind of more towards, well, you can, you can kind of do sort of like this drama kind of a thing, or you could do sort of like oral stories. Like I gave sort of ideas that look like classroom lessons right. as a starting point yeah. because it was, I don't feel safe. So I thought, let's make it checklistable. Let's make it kind of concrete. Mm -hmm. How might you respond to that as starting, you know, starting to integrate, mm -hmm. I almost said curricula, but mindfulness experiences into the classroom. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of options. Now, I mean, I'm a little bit of a neuro nerd, so I think, particularly at secondary, I think there's lots of opportunities because you can you can approach it from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. If we first teach kids how their brain works, and then we connect that emotion body, the mind body experience of what what is happening for you in your body when you feel anxiety. Every kid's going to describe that differently, but for kids to start to attune that, well, my heart beats faster, this has happening in my legs. And then we teach them, well, here's what's actually happening in your brain. And they, and they begin to understand what's going on in the brain. And then when we address mindfulness as a strategy, a perfect example, I have a father right now with dementia. Mm -hmm. And what I know about mindfulness is that it rebuilds the hippocampus. And hippocampus is the memory center of the brain. And so I don't know implicitly all the mechanisms for him of what's at play with his dementia, but know that he's losing memory. Mm -hmm. And so my entry point in him in a conversation about beginning to integrate mindfulness into his life is teaching him um, about his brain and teaching him about the capacity to rebuild his hippocampus. And does that interest him? And if, he, if so, here are some techniques we can use to do that. And so that's kind of a scientific entry point. And for a lot of kids, that's important. Particularly, mindfulness can be loaded. It can be connected to religious practice, mm -hmm. all of those things. And so to be able to make it an entry point for your average Joe citizen, I think we have to start to talk a different language about it. So, you know, we be careful of things like chimes and all of that kind of stuff. Like sometimes mindfulness is just, is my mind and my body in the same place? Mm -hmm. 
right? Sometimes it's that simple. When I'm taking a shower, am I in the shower? Am I feeling the water? Am I smelling the scent of the soap? Or am I thinking about my to-do list and the hundred things that I have to do today? Mindfulness is simply mind and body in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right? When I'm having this coffee this morning, am I just enjoying it? You know, or am I enjoying it while thinking about the laundry and the grocery list and am I going to be late? So I think when we think about school, we think about for kids, what gets in the way of you being fully present here? And so we know that you're going to, I think, succeed in school and be able to have the best student engagement experience when you're fully in present at school. Um, And so how do we help you tune into that? Um, a beautiful example I think that we've tried in some of our elementary schools is sometimes being fully present is really difficult, especially when I'm carrying a crap load of, of stuff, right? So we have these sort of rituals we'll create for kids where when you come into the classroom, there's a pile of rocks at the door, right? And we allow you to pick up that rock and you're able to take a Sharpie and write on that rock something that you brought in with you today that's weighing you down Hmm. and that's going to get in the way of you being fully present here today and we're going to allow you to write that down on that rock and you just leave it in this bucket at the door and just put it aside for now so that you can be present here so it's about creating some i think opportunities for kids to make choices about selective attention and where am i going to attend to right now so they don't feel like slaves to their experience they feel like they can be in the driver's seat of Mm -hmm. their own experience sometimes. And I think that's very appealing to your average adolescent who largely feels out of control related to their emotions, their hormones, the decisions that people make about what they eat when they sleep. Do you want to go somewhere? Well, I have to drive you. So they're not in control of anything. And so being able to see mindfulness as a way to control my attention um, can actually be very empowering. So that's what I would invite as maybe a way to think about it differently. It's not about self-regulation or calming down. It's about empowerment. Mm-hmm. It, set, it sets up my thinking before we hit the recording about where a, a question for me is if the mindful experience sits in opposition to the lesson plan. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, I'm not staying there, but it sets up a really nice dynamic for me to explore how to get there with students Mm -hmm. because I find, you know, if that becomes my reminder of I'm, I'm becoming too much of a teacher right now, Mm -hmm. then I may just be closing off the potential of the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, and I'll be honest as a student of this myself, just starting out when I first heard about mindfulness, I have to be honest, I was like, no way I'm not wearing Birkenstocks and a long skirt and you know, I'm, I'm Birkenstocks gonna, are comfortable. Fair enough, say, yeah, they fair are. enough. And I'm not, you know, <laughs> going to be wearing patchouli. Um, you know, and that's the image that I had in my head. Yeah. And until I was able to myself explore the scientific rooting of this, I couldn't enter in. And so knowing that as students, we all need different entry points for this. And we can imagine, like we took a mindfulness to go, to mm-hmm. course together this summer, you and I. And I watched everybody entered from a very different place. Some of us were maybe more in our heads, like I am, thinking about how, scientifically, how does this help me? Some were very spiritual in the way that they entered into that space. But it's all okay. Um, because it, it's our experience of it it doesn't have to become so directed and so scripted because then how is it any different Mm -hmm. if my mindfulness is about paying attention to myself and my experience in the present my experience is my experience so you can't control it for me you can't dictate for me what it's going to be you can invite me into an opportunity to enter my experience but enter it differently from you, from the person sitting next to me. Eyes open, eyes closed, sitting, laying down, yeah. it doesn't matter. None of those things actually matter. So it's not about compliance. And I think in schools we make lots of things about compliance, right? So I think That's the rule book. It, it, it is, is. And yeah. I think that's the discomfort sometimes for mindfulness. Mindfulness, I, I know even from my compass experience, something that I would call mindfulness. When I worked in compass, I worked in both the Catholic and public boards. And every time you go into a meeting in the Catholic board, they begin with a prayer or mm-hmm. intentions. That was mindfulness. And what a difference that made to a meeting. 
just that space of getting outside of our own heads and our agenda for that meeting to focus on something spiritual in that situation, but it created a whole different space then for the meeting, and I would say much more healthy, much more attuned. Um, I would say probably more productive overall. Yeah. And that's the translation I bring into a school setting. If we started every day by giving kids a few minutes to just ground themselves, to be able to let go perhaps what they carried in with them, maybe let go of some fears or anxieties they even have about that day, and just for a few minutes put those aside. We're not asking you to not think those things. You can pick them back up in five minutes, but for now we're just going to give you a bit of a space from that. It's just a nice, nicer start, you know, a nicer entry point um, where we all kind of become common. We have one shared experience for a few minutes. Unique individuals having this pause. It's simply, it's simply that. A pause, and now let's start together. I found some of the most, for myself, some of the most sort of profound the things that you notice about yourself when you're you're kind of going for whether it's meditation or mindfulness or whatever your slow practice is, are the moments where you somehow and for me sometimes it's accidental that you connect with the spiritual, but you don't stay there very long, mm-hmm. and then you sort of come back to whatever your starting point is, and then maybe you connect to your subconscious, mm-hmm. and then you kind of come back from it. And what I'm what I'm starting to, um, and then emotion, I mean, there's different places you can kind of land, but I always find like those are the places to go to, but coming back to more of a center spot. Mm -hmm. And I found, you know, in talking, you know, about that course in the summer, I found I was constantly being kind of pulled back and forth, not in in any aggressive fashion, but just my mind, my mind and body going there. Mm -hmm. And then I could feel myself coming back to the present moment, which is a, a very strange and different feeling and even to speak of it I'm not putting proper words to it but I think for me the mindfulness practice and I I love the way you put it is that you can do it coming from a scientific method Mm -hmm. because you can do a checklist that basically is that 10 point scale Mm -hmm. um do, do I feel the chair under my seat can I, am I aware of my breathing? You know, am I looking in the general direction from which sound is coming? Like mm-hmm. all of these things are mindful mm-hmm. practices. And it's the thing that I, I tend when I start to talk about is that it can be kind of concrete. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the spiritual or even the cultural. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to get into sort of the ethereal where you just don't know what it is. You just love it, right? Yeah. Um, I'm curious, with that, with that idea in mind, did you feel, coming from the science checklist perspective, mm-hmm. did you feel any connection to, let's call the spiritual, during that experience? Mm-hmm. Was it after the fact? Was it while it happened? And, you know, just if you can, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, with a month, a month, a month ago, two months ago, mm-hmm. but were you yo-yoing at all in those moments? I think what I connect to in mindfulness is when you say spiritual, so for me what I might say is that I become attuned to the more fullness of who I am, Mm. right? So I think we compartmentalize the way we move through the world. And so in mindfulness, sometimes I find that I'm opening the door to spaces that sometimes socially constructed or otherwise don't fit, right? And so it's like becoming in the fullness of myself and who I am. I also find that I center to a common humanity, I think there's something about a shared practice with other individuals who were all struggling in our own way. I find that hierarchy goes out the window, power imbalances kind of goes out the window. You know, we're all just kind of people in that space. Mm -hmm. And that's, as somebody who struggles with hierarchy and positional power, that's a nice spot to be, you know. And I, I just feel that and I, I think actually this might be some of the power for it in schools is that notion of common humanity for kids to see their teacher as a human mm. and for teachers to see kids as humans too. 
both struggling with the same thing, both struggling with shame and anger and heartbreak. And those are universal to the human experience. And when we move through the world putting on faces and closing out parts of ourselves that we don't deem to be socially acceptable for a given situation, I think we rob ourselves sometimes of our authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so I think mindfulness creates a space where all of those things are okay. And we, it invites us to be there with them, for, even if it's for a very brief time. So to me, that's part of a spiritual, I guess, reawakening, perhaps, mm -hmm. of some parts of yourself that you might forget are there. I think to that end, too, when you say you're, you're, you're appreciating the fullness of self, whatever you are, the discovery of that can, f you know, when... Okay, so go overly scientific. I remember there was a point when I looked at my iPhone as something magical. Right. Touch the screen, something happens. Mm -hmm. Over time, because of my tech brain, I come to understand, no, it's an electrical charge. That's a connection between my finger and the screen. Like, okay, still kind of magical, though. Mm -hmm. Looks really beautiful. But now I find out about apps. Now, it hasn't stopped my interest in using the technology. Mm -hmm. But maybe mindfulness, the suggestion I'm getting from you is that mindfulness sometimes is it's unlocking what's there. Mm -hmm. And that elation of feeling the connection, whether it's interesting, surprising, little, something a little bit dark, mm -hmm. that's where um, someone may find, be able to say more spiritual, because you may see something that you don't understand. <laughs> you know? sure. I don't yeah. know, I really don't know where that come from, I don't know where that idea came from. Yeah. And I think that what I've at least learned in clinical practice, for much of our hurts and pains in the world, have to be seen to be resolved mm -hmm. and I think mindfulness provides a space for them to be seen and, and why that's triggering for me is when you say the word dark because I exist in this space of being a mental health lead for a board there is some I feel whether it's real or just a perception of mine social construction of having to have it together all the time mm. Right? And so it's a constant try and put that's the face out there no matter what difficulty is happening. And that I find spaces of mindfulness almost always go to dark for me because those are the emotions that are going unattended to. Yes. And so I think that's um, why it, it's kind of valuable. It's like allowing witness to that emotion so that it can let it go because emotions are there to say to us something's wrong. You know, pay attention. You know, something's amiss here. And when we don't pay attention to those things, they live on, right? We, I often talk about how trauma gets stored in the body. And if we can allow experiences for that trauma to move through that emotion fully, then people can move towards healing. Um, and so I think mindfulness is an interesting space to play with that concept of bearing witness to emotions that are difficult, that we have disguised in some way or thought well, not appropriate for right now. I'll get to you later. It, that's the later. Hmm. So. Yeah. Welcome to the later. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let me ask you, what do you, where do you take inspiration from right now? Hmm. You know, to sort of, I mean, you, you can touch on the mindfulness or you just say, you know, hmm. your daily practice in, in, in your current portfolio. What are some of the spaces or people or resources that are kind of lighting you up right now? I would say any time I get time with students um, for me because I don't often in my role have that opportunity. And I just am constantly floored and blown away by them. And I, you know, know every time I have an experience with any of our students. I recently at the leadership retreat had lunch with our two, two student trustees. Mm -hmm. And they're just beautiful humans. Um, and their passions and hopes and dreams and insight on, on we talked about mental health and stigma and insight into what it would take to move the bar on that. Um, those, it, it's just really rich. I mean, that's, that's why, that's who we're doing this for. And so if I'm not, you know, inspired and connected to the reality of relevance of their lives, then I, I have no business doing this work. So I feel like, um, even in clinical practice, the same, you know, people would arrive in, in the office just carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. And to think about what it took for them to be able to get into that room and, and then to be able to be vulnerable with where they were at with a person who's a complete stranger. I mean, mm. that's courage to me. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and so, you know, I think working in mental health, you have the privilege of walking alongside people in some of their darkest moments. And I think that's inspiring for me is that these are people who, unlike myself often, dare to be vulnerable um, and have the courage to share pain. And that I, I, that I find inspiring because I, I think that there's so much of our energy that is wasted on trying to show the world who we think they want us to be. I, am, I was listening to a podcast this morning about this core wound of unworthiness that all of us carry and how we spend a lot of our lives trying to suppress that I'm not worthy by proving our worth um, and how much energy that is and thinking about, well, who is this universal judge that's, you know, making a decision on whether we're worth something or not? Mm -hmm. And it's each other. Um, and I think that students, until, you know, socially they learn to start being judgmental people. I remember we looked at this amazing study of just even how different cultural groups entered into space so we were doing some research in the community of maple at one point in time and we noticed that at elementary school diversity was celebrated hmm. but it's that whole thing shifted by high school and so when we would watch groups then suddenly in high school they would be collecting based on a cultural group based on color of skin different some of those different things whereas in elementary school it's like they didn't know yet. Um, and there's something really beautiful about that, about, you know, we see these things on YouTube all the, all the time about kids who haven't learned to see difference yet, you know, and you're looking at a black kid and a white kid and how we're going to dress the same and trick our teacher, you know, on Halloween and she's not going to know who's who mm -hmm. because they don't see it. Yeah. Um, and somewhere along the line we lose that. So I, when we talk about inspiration for me, I like to look at what I call some of the, the kind of rooted humanity before we got destroyed by society. Little kids, people with autism who maybe don't have all of the social rules that the rest of us are operating by. I think they live in the beautiful truth of humanity all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the kinds of things that inspire me because I think my goal as a human is to figure out each and every day, how can I live more authentically? less as I think I'm supposed to be and more authentic. So tough. <laughs> gonna, Very tough. It's so tough. It's so tough. You make me think of watching my children go to the park and the idea of going to the park is just to play and you play just by running beside someone and I can't tell you how many times we're going home and who was that kid you're running with? I don't know. Now you start to realize very quickly that the name wasn't important for the experience. Mm -hmm. We put that in as a social convention. Hi, my name is Chris. Hi, my name is Michelle. And it's funny that there's traps that happen thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, but my kids, it's not there yet. And I know, you know, I mourn the loss of it ahead of time. I know I work to not take it away from them myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't defend them. I can't defend them from the world. I can't defend them from how, how it will be brought to them in other spaces. Yeah. And so I think it's teaching them how to critically examine those things and mm -hmm. challenge those things and question them. And I think when you talk about inspiration, when kids do that before we teach them not to, that's what excites me. Yeah. Right? Like watch any new staff member. We've had a new staff mem member in student services this year. And I love when we have new staff members because they ask out loud all of the questions the rest of us are thinking. Too close to ask. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I think yeah. that's I wonderful. Love that too. Right? And, I, you know, I remember when we first began the mental health work in the board, I had students on each and every committee because my gosh, can we get stuff done quicker? Because a bad idea is shot down within five... No, no, that sucks. That's not going to happen. The students would tell us that, and so we wouldn't waste time trying to... Oh, Chris, what a lovely idea. Yeah. Um, I think that they're just living in honesty uh, is a lot more productive. It is. And again, so tough. So tough. It is so tough. So I have a couple more things, if you got time. Yeah, for sure. Um... The, the, um, the next for you. Mm. So it's not, it's not next career mm -hmm. per se. It's more 
as you find yourself, wh wherever you find yourself right now in your portfolio and the projects you're working on, mm -hmm. what um, what has a little bit of that thrill factor as far as you know something coming down the coming down the pipe, mm -hmm. a next focus, uh, a, an area of interest that's just kind of seeded, like it's it, we're not there yet, mm -hmm. but something that you're developing or looking at? Yeah, I think one of the things that, probably the thing that gets me most in trouble is that in this job I find I'm kind of the middle of the road chick who's walking this tension between um, the educator teachers who are in the classroom who really have access to the kids most of the time, mm -hmm. but my job is mental health. And then on the other side I have the clinicians who work for the board, our psychology and our social work. And I have felt that my role has been to make mental health accessible to people, mm -hmm. to take research that might be, you know, high level, highfalutin, whatever, and make sense of it for the average human being, whether that's a teacher, a parent, whoever, which has sometimes got me in hot water from professionals who want it to remain a professionalized practice and worry. And cloaked? In As some in, ways. In some ways, almost like codified, yeah, overly codified, in, okay. I think in some ways, right? And I think, you know, it's like, oh, don't make it so, don't make everybody think that they can manage anxiety because then who's going to come to us for treatment of anxiety? Right. And it, it's not real. Like, it's not a real dilemma. I think we all want the best for everyone, but there is a, a little bit of a fear you know, if I've been to, if I have a PhD in psychology, I've been to university forever and ever, and, and mental health is really complex, and you're oversimplifying it. I think when I look at what excites me is helping people see that there are some simple things. Right. It is accessible for every everybody to do something to impact mental health in a positive way. So the work we're about to embark on is uh, the trauma-informed classroom and trauma-informed schools. And when you look at, you know, let's just take the broadest lens on trauma. It could be anything. Trauma can be, uh, you know, having a lot of medical procedures as a young infant, mm -hmm. right? There's lots of things. It's not all abuse. It's not all that. There's lots of things that fall within the developmental range of what trauma is. What happens in our brain is that our brain decided, I need to now protect you. And so there are changes that happen in our brain that now our brain becomes protector. And we are moving through the world now in a different way. Hmm. So things that would not to your average person be threatening become threats because your brain is on hyper alert. Right? And so when you look at schools and you think about we've got students who enter our doors every day in that state, hyper vigilant, thinking the world is out to get them, we have a huge opportunity to send their brain a new message and to say, there is safety here. You can let that guard down. And when we can provide some of those experiences in schools and classrooms for the brain to breathe for a little while and say, you know what, I let that guard down and nothing bad happened. Mm -hmm. Time and time again, as kids have those experiences in schools, the brain will start to reprogram itself. And that trauma history that's been stored and locked in that brain and that pattern of functioning that's kind of stuck in hypervigilance lets go and provides some healing and freedom for that young person. We can do that in schools. That's not, that's not about one-on-one -on -one individual treatment and lots of people with trauma of one-on-one -on -one individual treatment will be part of the picture. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I know is that if I'm six hours a day in this environment, that's six hours of time that we can figure out ways to communicate to the brain safety. Yeah. That's what I'm excited about. It sounds, it sounds like it's going to bring, to me, I'm hearing even some structural changes then for... Possibly, yeah. absolutely. Some of the schools that we've been doing this work on, the way that they approach hallways is different. The way they mm -hmm. approach lighting is different. The way that we've looked at their bells and we've listened to their bells. You know, imagine that I'm a refugee new in this country and for the first time that bell goes off. Yeah, it's going to sound a lot like maybe other bells we've heard. Absolutely. That are not supposed to just be Pavlovian, like, okay, now I do math. Correct. It's, I got you. Right? So when a bell goes off and we've got kids that automatically go to hide under their desk because yeah. they think it means something else. I think though those are messages to us. That's a huge opportunity to do something differently. Yeah. That's good. That's a good one. That's a very good one. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's really exciting because you think about even all of us, every, every single one of us as adults can probably think back to an experience we had in school that somehow we're still carrying with us, that somehow, sent, whether intended or not, sent a message to us, not safe here, need to do something differently. It can even be things simple. I, I often, I probably have a, my own bias with respect to this, but the preference for extroversion that we love to have in schools and that the way that we assess kids on their ability to re-communicate learning in public ways, public speaking, which for an introvert wouldn't be the preference, right? And so we create these situations where in order to succeed, you have to have these extrovert-like behaviors which might be out of preference for you as an introvert. So when we could even expand the opportunities for how we look at how do we assess learning and can we accommodate more ways that learning can be demonstrated than the traditional extroverted way of public speaking, present your project in front of the class. Um, you know, likewise for adults in meetings. Is the only way to get your point across to articulate that verbally, or are there other ways and spaces that we can entertain ideas? Mm -hmm. um, so these are all things that are really part of being trauma-informed. So structural, slightly philosophical, and then also building the capacity on it to see, you know, what this looks like. You know, it's interesting because it also strikes me that it's, it's one that's going to have some... I can't imagine the test driving of some of these tools in a in a classroom or a school because mm -hmm. uh, everybody's got to be all in on that. Oh, yeah. Everyone's got to be all in because it becomes, it really, that protect, it, and I almost said initially everyone's got to be all in, but I think there's an element of building that capacity of understanding is going to be as much of a 180 for the individuals supporting the... Um, the children mm -hmm. with trauma or uh, right. individuals with trauma. So that 180 for the how you approach teaching, learning, experiencing, mm -hmm. and with that almost reverse of the individual that has experienced trauma to build a 180 and come back. Yeah. And it, it, it requires us to be ultimately flexible. And I think, you know, this is the challenge for teachers in the struggle is that you know, you think about even in a modern learning context, there's notions out there that we get rid of all desks, we get rid of all rows, and then there's still, there's going to be the students who are going to say, but I need the desk and I need the row. So we have to be able to look at what's the kid that needs the ball, what's the kid that needs to stand, what's the kid that needs the structure, mm -hmm. um, and somehow figure out how we create space for them all in schools. It's, it's, that can be challenging, but schools are doing it. Um, and it's pretty incredible when you see it living live. Some of the projects we did on in modern learning and mental health last year were the most exciting things I've been part of in my career. You know, I look at some of the schools that allowed student voice to be front and center of all decision making around programming and structure and the, the change in their school. When students felt we authentically had a problem, you allowed us to voice it and you responded to it. It's magical. That's a huge relationship building tool. Now I, I trust the adults. When you ask for my voice next time, I'm going to tell you because I, res I know that it will be heard and respected and responded to. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, man, you, you hit all my notes. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, I got you. Um, so, I guess... Last last thing, last thing, and then we, it almost looks like we got rain coming in a little bit. But last thing, so the um, you know the strategy of of focusing on math and mental wellness and modern learning, which I've always kind of wrestled with. Modern learning is modern learning and math and mm -hmm. mental wellness. I feel as if right now that we're kind of kind of approaching clicking on all cylinders for all three. Mm -hmm. Is that is the, and I'm and we're not all there. It's still mm -hmm. kind of flexing, mm -hmm. but I think the one that I was really waiting for was the mental wellness. Mm -hmm. Waiting to see how that would come into the mix because it's a pillar, right? Mm -hmm. You call a thing a pillar. Yeah. You're you're wondering yeah. how that supports the superstructure. Mm -hmm. um, would you agree with that? Would you agree we're we're sort of getting there? Like it's it's coming into being now where we have the we have not only the philosophical, but we also have a little bit of the scientific and a little bit of the actionable things that people can kind of say, yeah, you know what, we're making a difference here. Mm -hmm. 
I think so, and I think it sometimes it is the intersection of those things that's been critical. When we continue to silo them as the three M's, like yeah. they are separate, not helpful. I think some of the most valuable work we did last year was when we paired math and mental health together. And let's look at perfectionism through that lens. And how do we conduct the math classroom to realize that sometimes the way we structure math, we're actually promoting anxiety. And we're actually encouraging and celebrating perfectionism. And if as a mental health person, I'm coming into that conversation saying, hey, do you know about the link between perfectionism and suicidality? This is not something to celebrate. Right, this is something that we need to manage, mitigate, and build protection against. And then that changed the conversation. And then we changed how do we structure the math classroom then? How do we look at assessment in math so that we're making sure we're not celebrating perfect? Um, and so all of those are, are really exciting conversations. When we look at modern learning not being about technology, but being about student engagement, yeah. because that's really what, for me, modern learning is about relevancy. Yep. Is when I go to school, is it going to be relevant for my life? Then I'm engaged, right? And so how do we make learning engaging for kids? It's about relevancy. Mental health is relevant for kids, yeah. um, right? And so figuring out how, how we blend those pieces. I still think that the tension, the, the thing that we have to wrestle with a little bit is that, you know, and I, th- I think I'm a bit of a broken record on this one, as a system, structurally forever we have governed ourselves by student achievement. Mm. And when you think about, yes, we're successful because we're achieving, that doesn't work when you factor in mental health because some of our highest achieving students have the poorest outcomes in terms of mental health. Right, And so we have to start to think about it more critically. It's not just lovely that you have 99%, but you're thinking, I'm going to kill myself if I get 95%. Yes. That's not health. Right, And so how we have... Without the shrug in there. Without the, come on, it's only 4%. Right. Because that's a pretty deep 4%. For so sure. much is happening in that gap of the 4%. Yeah, for sure. And so to really help kids. So it's not to be looking out and saying, okay, these students are achieving, so they are well. It's not. And I think sometimes we've done an A plus B equals C. Well, students can't achieve unless they're mentally healthy. Not true. Lots of our students are achieving despite it, Mm -hmm. right? And so while it's ideal to have both, they're not mutually exclusive necessarily. So I think it's about realizing there's complexity and and muck within this, not to be, not to simplify this to the degree, you know, that I said before where I've got clinicians saying, whoa, don't make it so simple Mm -hmm. to acknowledge the complexity. The brain is really complex. This is really complex stuff. But I... I think it, it, it lives in the right place when it lives in education. I think education, I think, has some beautiful infrastructure for teaching people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of learning that happens, and so how can we help people learn about mental health? Let's leverage some of that same infrastructure that gave us success in literacy and gave us success in math and leverage it for learning about mental health in ways that are relevant. A colleague of mine... In, in a different context, said that there's new fluencies that we need to learn in education. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the space that we're in right now. Mm-hmm. And he, he also sort of made a good case that it's also, it's not just about, it's not just about the, the leaders bringing that fluency to that common center, you know, the pillars and that sort of thing. It's about the individuals existing at that center being able to communicate to each other. Mm-hmm. And that's what I feel is sort of slowly emerging in this as we start to see some of the, you know, events where um, it isn't just, it isn't just about using ed tech. We include somebody that has sort of figured out the way to connect the mindfulness to it, or it isn't just about mathematics. It's about some of the things with anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we present I think I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, one of the ways that I'm going to work to include mindfulness is just make it look like we've been doing it the whole time. Mm -hmm. So you show up at your math PD session Mm -hmm. and there is some sort of a welcoming acknowledgement. You have the land treaty acknowledgement. We might do a meditation and then we move into some mathematics and then you get your bio break or whatever. But it becomes the seamlessness to make it work and you can sort of point it out and say well that's new yeah. but then you're already in the river <laughs> you're moving on and all of a sudden you've got a resource that makes so much more sense holistically to where i think the board is trying to go yeah i think yeah absolutely i agree you are awesome
That was a great combo. <laughs> that was a great combo. Oh, um, Your title is Chasing Squirrels, and I think that's my brain. Yeah. So hopefully we can make some sense. Yeah, no, no. I think it was enti- entirely sense. Is it sensical? sensical. Sensible. Yes. Yeah, sensible and sensical. And part of, I think, talking about some of these things is, you know, your expression of saying bring it, bringing it from, you know, what we do, theory to practice. If that theory in its gathered data sort of structure is completely impenetrable, Mm -hmm. then, then, you know, I've heard that that's a job for some hospitals. There's actually someone that's hired to translate that data into something that's entirely approachable, understandable, not testable, but just they can sit across the table. Someone can read it and go, oh, I get it. I get what's wrong with me. Yes. And maybe that's also the space that we're in now right now, except there isn't necessarily someone always specific that does it. Mm -hmm. Building capacity means that we can do it with each other. Like we can start to speak, mathematicians can speak to, wellness consultants can speak to the DLRT digital people. So that's kind of cool. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you for talking with me. Thank you. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Chasing Squirrels podcast can be found on Podbean and iTunes. If you want to have a conversation on the podcast, please reach out to me. Probably the best way to connect with me is on Twitter. So that would be at Chris J. Clough. I also blog a little bit on WordPress. Feel free to check in on some of those topics. And I really do appreciate the time you spent with the podcast. Thank you for listening and have a fantastic evening.